We're going to unravel the layers of faith woven throughout history. President Ronald Reagan said, if we ever forget that we're one nation under God, we'll be one nation gone under. What would happen if we decide that we don't want God in our classrooms and we don't want to mention him and have national days of prayer? Would America be on a better course or a worse course? Well, we can look at other countries and see past behavior is the best indicator of future performance. And one of those other countries is the Soviet Union, which for 70 years had outlawed God. Our guest today is Ben Grace, and he has been a missionary in the former United Soviet Socialist Republic. And we're going to learn a lot that maybe can help us here in America. Stay tuned. Here's the question of the day, which will be answered at the end of the program. Which U.S. president proclaimed a day of fasting and prayer just prior to the Civil War? President Harry S. Truman, in 1950 at Gonzaga University, said the greatest obstacle to peace is, led, is a modern tyranny led by a small group who have abandoned their faith in God. I want to say that again, just to let it sink in. The greatest obstacle to peace is a modern tyranny led by a small group who have abandoned their faith in God. These tyrants have forsaken ethical and moral beliefs. Again, Harry S. Truman. When we get rid of God, what happens? Well, that's why I put together a book, Three Secular Reasons Why America Should Be Under God. We're visiting with Ben Grace. And Ben, you were in the Soviet Union 10 years prior to the Iron Curtain coming down. You uh, saw great revivals. And uh, gee, I want you to fill in the blanks, but it, it seemed like there was this period where there was all kinds of enthusiasm about God. But after that, I want you to tell us what's going on today. What we saw was is, uh, uh, prior to the point of us smuggling Bibles, being the underground church, you know, during that time when the Soviet Union broke apart, there was just a great openness for the gospel uh, in the TV, radio, universities. Uh, you know, people hungry for the word of God. I believe I even have one picture here where we were giving out Bibles in Ukraine where uh, we were working with a Messianic Jewish pastor. And Bobby R is where they killed all the Jewish people. Well, tell us that story. Well, this was, this was uh, Bobby R is where Hitler came in and also the Ukrainian police rounded up you know, all the Jews they could find. There was a big trench, and they shot them into this trench. We actually talked to survivors that were covered in dead bodies and crawled out. And eventually there was a monument put up to commemorate all these people. So there was this big uh, Jewish gathering to remember those that were dead. And uh, many uh, Russian Jews came to this, or Ukraine, and Ukrainian Jews came to this uh, memorial. And we were working with a Messianic pastor, and we had brought Bibles. And this was still during the Soviet time, before, right before the collapse. And people wanted the Bible so bad that they knocked the pastor down, ripped the boxes open, and were fighting over the Bibles because they wanted them so desperately. And some, we, we called it Bible rugby. When people actually got a Bible, you know, they'd start running, and someone else would actually go after them you know, and actually try to knock them down to take their Bible. You know, and I think about you know, in the West, you know, people don't want to hear about God, and here, you know, if they get a Bible you know, that's to them like it's the football, and they're going for the touchdown to, to actually come away with it. You know, so we were during a time of that where everywhere we went, you know, we could go to an army base and they would gather the whole army base, a submarine base. Uh, we would, in schools, orphanages, prisons, no matter where we went, we just would say, we're here to preach the gospel and they would, you know, assemble everyone. But I think what happened was, is uh, America culture, I mean, we weren't ready for the collapse of the Soviet Union because they were looking to us to bring a godly culture. And from what, so what we saw when the Soviet you know, Union collapsed, there was an ideology that was broken, and there was an emptiness. You know, I, taught my, I had one interpreter who had four PhDs, and he was my interpreter down in Odessa, and he said he believed everything that the Soviet Union told him. And eventually what happened was is a Mercedes-Benz came into Odessa, and he saw the technology of the Mercedes-Benz, and immediately he knew that everything he'd been taught was a lie. And he thought, I have to go back and relearn everything I've been told. Because the Soviet Union had said that their country was the most advanced, that they had the best health care, that they had the best technology. 
So he had an ideological vacuum. Well, fortunately, we were able to meet him and lead him to the Lord, you know, but the, the other part of the vacuum was filled when Hollywood began to come in with MTV and, you know, the smut and filth that America uh, produces and many of the worst movies. So if you actually went to a restaurant and were to look up at the TV, you would see some of the very worst that America has to offer, you know, being pushed on the republics of the former Soviet Union and now free countries. And I think that, uh, that the immorality and the filth and the pornography creates a hardness towards God and towards the gospel. And I think you see it in Europe and that European hardness towards God is actually starting to spread so that, the, you know, there are still, in one sense, you still have many more believers, many more churches. I mean, last time I was in Moscow before, there was just a couple of handful of pe believers that I knew in underground churches. I was there with a Korean pastor who was, had a Bible school and we spent two weeks with them. And he said he thought, he, he thought that there was at least 20,000, you know, uh, Korean missionaries working in Moscow and congregations. Well, you know, the Moscow region encompasses 8 million people. So it's like a nation unto itself, you know, the Moscow region. Re but uh, so you go from there being very few believers to very many, but you all see, also see a cultural decline like you see in America where there's a hardness of heart. It's almost, it's almost like a dam breaking, you know, where the dam is... Uh, blocking sewage. You know, it's like raw sewage and there's a dam there and the dam is broken and the raw sewage is just sweeping across America, sweeping across Europe and destroying marriage, destroying the family, destroying marriage, work ethics. Marriage. Tell us about what's happening with marriage. Well, marriage is on the decline. I mean, marriage, I think, could actually become extinct, you know, because so many people now in Europe and even in Estonia are just, uh, you know, civil union, maybe not even a civil union, I would call it common law wife, common law husband, where they're, they're not even going to the church, they're not giving civil unions, they're just... So here we have the, the, um, the gay movement in America wanting to uh, basically destroy the traditional Judeo-Christian marriage, but uh, over there, uh, the marriage is, is going away too, because they're just living in what they have saw Hollywood exported and so forth uh, after the fall of the Iron Curtain. Oh yeah, even uh, we work with a, a, a great pastor, uh, Victor, you met him and you were in his church and, and spoke, which was a great message. And uh, you know, I, I, I've spoken there into the church to the young people about my experiences and even my interpreter being in, put in prison. and. You know, pastors, I mean, I know a pastor in, in Ukraine whose father was put in prison for five years, began preaching again, was put in prison, so he now, never really saw his father, and the young people have forgotten that. Well, so know, even, even people from Russia, you know, they, they're raised on MTV, and they don't even know their own heritage or the, or the, the price of the, now, that was paid. Now, one of the stories I wanted to touch on to fit in there, uh, you have a picture here of um, uh, a city where during the Soviet era, uh, they would give red scarves and tell that story. Well, we had gone down with, uh, and at that time we couldn't travel freely. This was, you know, we went down with a university group, you know, and, uh, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> we got arrested coming out. Uh, um, so we <laughs> just remembered that. Uh, we went down with a university group and we were um, basically visiting the churches, visiting the synagogues, trying to find the underground believers. And we went to this one church, and uh, we, after church they had a picnic, and there was two little girls, and I was talking to them and kind of playing with them, and they were playing with some toys, and, you know, it was just nice, nice sunny day. Well, the tour group, this university group, the next day went into the university, and I saw those two girls, and all the young people in the school had their red scars. But Our the, university is just like a school. No, the, no, we were with the university group, but we were in an elementary school. Elementary school, okay. And these two girls did not have their red scars because they were, you know, not the young pioneers, not Lenin's devils, not, you know, whatever. They, they, they had, uh, you know, basically been ostracized for their faith in God and so were forbidden to wear their red scarves so or had the, chosen to not wear them. So the Christian girls did, were the two girls in the whole entire class that did not have a red scarf, and all the other ones wore the red scarves because they were called Lenin's devils. <laughs> Many of them were. That's what they called them. That's what they yeah. called them. And so the peer pressure was to get everybody to join the Communist Party, and these two girls had to suffer this being ostracized by not having.